Good afternoon. I'd like to thank everybody for attending today. Good. We're very excited. We have over 50 school districts from 15 different states around the country attending today. So we're very excited about the event. A couple quick items before we get started. Our webinar is provided by Quest Tech today out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Quest Tech has been successfully delivering managed technology services in K-12 for over 30 years. Our services range from technology assessments to complete technology department outsourcing. So why do we call today's webinar Bring Your Own Disaster? And why did we select the BYOD topic? It's because we believe there's more to every hot topic or technology that is provided in these webinars and events. <clears throat> BYOD is just the tip of the iceberg on what's going on today and its association with many other technologies and concepts. And all of our future and today's webinars kind of help to aim to understand what's under the surface give you a little bit different perspective on these very hot common topics. Additional note for anybody, uh, we're having a wireless BYOD webinar at the Heinz Field, the home of the Steelers, on the 24th with uh, wireless demos and seminars and presentations based on BYOD and K-12 with tours of the Steelers facility during the day. So that's going to go on on the 24th. If you can make it to the Pittsburgh area, we'll be sending out uh, invites to that. We got some great uh, resources lined up today. Just to introduce uh, our first uh, resource on the call is uh, Mr. Norton Gusky. He's from Fox Chapel School District, uh, retired director of technology with over 15 years in the classroom, uh, and now leads the uh, Quest, Quest Tech Assessment Division as our assessment architect. Mr. Mike Graham, very fortunate to have him as one of the national leaders in BYOD. He's from Hempfield School District and he'll be interacting with Norton today on the presentation to give you a real-world experience of what they've done at Hempfield. I'd also like to thank some of the people who helped put this webinar together. Mr. Bruce Downing, our VP of Marketing, and the wonderful Kylie Yers, who has done a great job putting these slides and this whole program together. So without any further delay, I'd like to turn the webinar over to Mr. Norton Gusky. Thanks, Jeff. Today we really want to try to learn the whole story. What we're going to try to do today is a little different than you may have seen in terms of other presentations. Often, it's really not about teaching and learning. That's what we're all about. And so we want to make sure we really focus on how bringing your own devices or technology does not become bring your own disaster, because you're really looking at and planning for teaching and learning. You normally hear just success stories. We want to really give you what's behind the scenes What's necessary? What kind of planning do you have to do? What kind of risk taking do you have to do? You often hear that bringing your own will save you money. But there also are some issues in terms of what do you have to be investing in, such as your infrastructure. We want to make sure that you understand it's not about saving money. It's about really empowering your staff and your students. And normally you hear one vendor's point of view. Well, today we're not going to talk about any proprietary solutions or products. We're really going to be talking about a process. We're going to be talking about the issues, the pluses and the minuses, and trying to be really giving you the full picture, letting you know the whole story. We're going to be doing a poll. And Jeff, do you want to explain about the poll so we get a little bit of information from our audience? Sure. Uh, Kylie's going to introduce a quick poll. we got four of them today total. They're very quick. Uh, we want to get a uh, landscape on who's joining us. You'll see the results as soon as we're done. So if you just click on one of the areas of the poll and select your role, and then we'll get moving. All right, right now we're about 66% of you voted, which is fantastic for as many people on the webinar. 80% right now. Eighty-two percent voted. We'll give it uh, a couple more seconds, and then Kylie, you can go ahead and close the poll. We'll see the re results. Okay, Kylie. So we have quite a bit of uh, directors or school administrators at twenty-nine percent. As you can see, three percent board members, sixty-one percent directors of technology, uh, and we have six percent uh, teacher and librarian. So that's fantastic. Thank you. That really helps us a lot as we try to move forward. 
and to give you a, a little overview in terms of what we're doing today and what do we mean when we're talking about bringing your own device it really comes down to we're talking about bringing consumer devices and we need to be thinking about starting with a plan so as we go through the presentation we'll explore what's under the surface that iceberg that could be waiting there to be, bring a disaster We'll ask you a number of additional questions, as Jeff mentioned. There'll be three other opportunities for you to share information with us. And we're also, at the end, going to share you a 10-step game plan for you to use. You'll have a chance to ask your questions in the chat window. Please do so, and we'll try to make sure that we address those before the end of today's session. A number of you, we really do thank you, send some questions ahead of time in your registration. We've already tried to incorporate answers to those as we move forward in today's presentation. So we have a really wonderful group from all over the country. Um, what we saw is that, believe it or not, we have at least one representative group from Alaska. We have people from California. We have people from, as Jeff mentioned, a whole variety of states. So we're really excited today to try to address the needs, try to give you information that's going to help you move forward. When we talk about bringing your own device, it's important to look at it from a point of view of a spectrum. It's not that you start and do some, today something that may be a complete plan. And Mike Graham's going to share a little bit with us how he got involved and it really becomes a model in terms of what you may want to be thinking about as you develop from where you are today to where you may want to be going. So Mike, do you want to share in terms of your story and how you started and where you're at at this present time? Are you there, Mike? I'm not hearing Mike. I'm not sure he was with us a few minutes ago. Well, <laughs> let me. We may have no. to try to see if we can get Mike reconnected then to us. Mike is on the phone in the eastern part of Pennsylvania, and we'll have to try to see what happened to him. But what I'll try to do is just give a little bit of background in terms of how the Hempfield plan developed and how it started moving from more of a teacher-centered to a student-centered plan. And if Mike gets then connected, we'll have him then join whenever he's able to. The key thing in terms of where you want to start is where you're at, where you're having going to have the greatest success you want to be able to look at from the point of view in terms of, that's you, Jeff, not Mike. So what we want to do is, for instance, where Mike began when he started was to be starting to give people guest access. Often that's where most school districts are, is that you basically aren't sharing your resources, but what you're doing is you're allowing people to be accessing Norman, your network. You there? Yeah. Okay, Mike, there you are. Okay, we lost oh, you for a okay. minute. Sorry about that. Ran into some issues there with the phone. Uh, did you still want me to go through uh, the... Sure. Why don't you explain then your okay. story, where you began, and then just take it from there. Okay. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, back in the, the fall of 2009, um, our high school administration was uh, trying to de decide how to deal with uh, students bringing in uh, personal devices, cell phones, and things like that. And up until that point, uh, it was it was really a, a significant discipline issue in that uh, the... the, the High school handbook and district policy really forbid students from uh, even bringing those onto the property. Uh, and it became pretty apparent that this isn't something that was going to be going away or changing and that uh, we kind of had to adapt our, um, our policies to, uh, to deal with students bringing in personal devices. Uh, at the same time, the, um, the tech department was looking at some other ways to uh, deal with um, classrooms for the future equipment, which in Pennsylvania was a uh, a grant from the state that uh, infused a large number of student laptops uh, in the form of carts uh, all over the building. And so we were looking at some ways to, uh, to deal with, those, with that equipment uh, aging out. Uh, and we thought that uh, moving in, the, in, in a BYOD direction, and at the time it wasn't called BYOD, we were just looking at uh, allowing students to bring their own devices in, um, would be one possible solution to, to this equipment being phased out. 
so after talking with the, the high school administration, we, um, we put together a plan of how to enable, um, securely enable students, uh, student access to uh, the internet and some uh, specific district resources, which I think we'll get to a little later when we talk about security. Um, but uh, we, we went through a number of meetings with, uh, with both the staff and the, uh, the district administration, uh, teachers. Uh, we sent a number of letters home to parents uh, explaining what we were doing, why we were doing it, um, what, the, what the expectations were on the part of the student, what the district's responsibilities would be. Uh, and then beginning, uh, we, we actually conducted a pilot group uh, in our library where uh, on after school or during um, study halls, students could bring in uh, their devices and use them, but only within the library uh, for research purposes. Uh, that was in the spring of 2010. And then the beginning of the following school year in fall, uh, we opened that network up to the entire building uh, for, uh, for everyone to access it at specific times. And uh, I can go into, uh, into those details if you'd like as well as far as when we allow uh, students to access and what, um, what some of the restrictions are. Uh, but that pilot group uh, in the library proved that the concept worked uh, and we knew what we had to do in terms of expanding our wireless network to support uh, more devices. Uh, and also that, that pilot group kind of uh, set some teachers at ease. There was a lot of hesitation initially about uh, rolling things out uh, on a larger scale to let students bring uh, in devices. But uh, as we kind of found out, the, the, uh, the world did not collapse, the sky didn't fall. Uh, it, it, um, we, we went into the project without uh, a whole lot of um, uh, specific goals in mind. We, we wanted to see if it would be a possibility for replacing uh, those um, student laptops, but we knew uh, that even if it did, it would be many, many years before we really got into a position where we could scale back. So uh, it was really more of a, um, uh, just a, a kind of a, a crazy idea, if you will, that we wanted to try out and see where it went. Uh, and it's, it has been successful in terms of giving students access, but uh, it hasn't been the, um, the savior of our budget, so to speak, in terms of uh, recouping money that we otherwise would have been spending on uh, student laptops. And we'll talk more about that, Mike. You know, but the points you made, I think, are really important, is that you need to have that starting point, and it's really a project in progress. And so I think people need to think about that, is where can they start, where do they want to be going? And so we have a better sense in terms of where our audience is. What we'd like to do is to take a look at a second poll. And um, do you want to explain, Jeff, what will be happening sure, this time? Man. Yep. Uh, we want to get a, a poll. Kylie's going to start it, getting an idea of where you are on a list. We were quite surprised in December on the number of people that had started or were, were mature in BYOD all the way to the uh, rookie. So we want to see where we're at today with this many people on the, uh, on the webinar. So uh, vote where you think you're on the BYOD spectrum. Haven't started all the way to advanced. So we're 73 percent, 76 percent, a little bit. Jeff, are you still there? Sounds like we're having some audio problems. So let me try to um, just kind of bring things back and just mention a few things. We've already had one question asking about when will this be available? Will it be available in terms of the archiving? And what we're looking at is basically we're going to be archiving this presentation. We'll have it available in mid-January. But tomorrow, we'll be sending you via email for all those who've registered a list of the resources and what we're calling our 10 steps to success. That'll be coming, and you'll have that. Um, and so in terms of next steps, where we want to be going, let's look at in terms of why we would be wanting to do bringing your own device. 
one of the keys that many of you probably have heard in terms of is preparing your students for 21st century skills. Having your own device is one of the ways so that your students are involved in critical thinking, communication, collaboration, and creativity. Just yesterday, there were two other elements that were added to those four C's by one of the spin-off groups that was the Partnership for 21st Century Skills that originally set up this whole idea in terms of the four C's. And I thought it really fit right in with this concept of why you'd want to bring your own device. The two elements were, one was self-direction. You want to have your students where they take ownership, where they're in control, where they're making decisions, they're asking questions. What makes more sense than giving them the opportunity to have their own device so that they do have that sense of self-direction? You're preparing them for their next level, where they're going to be at a college, some type of post-secondary, or at a job, where they're going to have opportunities to use things, and they need to know the responsibilities that are behind them. The other is not quite as evident, but it's, it's, an, I think, it's important to think about. In today's world, it's really a, a global awareness or global empathy. So when we think about those 21st century skills, having students using their own devices really allows us to move in those directions. We also want to think about connected learning. What's happened in the last 10 years is we no longer think about learning just taking place in school, in the brick and mortar environment. We're now talking about 24-7 access to information, anywhere, anytime. So it's really important that we think about how that fits in. When I was the director of technology for the Fox Chapel Area School District, I began going down this road over 10 years ago, and I looked at colleges and I looked at businesses and realized they were already allowing users to have their own devices. We needed to look at in terms of what could we learn from them. And so I was very fortunate. I partnered with Carnegie Mellon University and had a chance to start thinking about what does that mean as we move in this direction. We also want to think about in terms of some of the things that are already in place. The Consortium for School Networking put together a document that has some really excellent results and some information. One of the key things is that parents are open to purchasing mobile devices. It's something you may want to think about in terms of a partnership with your community. We also have a large percentage of students already at middle school, high school, who really want to use their own devices and see an obstacle to actually using technology at school that they don't have access to devices on a regular basis. That came out of Project Tomorrow in the Speak Up survey. And we also then look at in terms of the fact that there are some issues. And we'll be talking about some of those issues as well. But the key thing is, is that we have supported the students. We have supported parents. And so we need to be thinking about how do we then provide that access in a way that's going to be an academic benefit for the students, for the school. One of the key things we want to be thinking about is empowering the students. There was an opportunity for Quest Tech to have a roundtable of educational leaders. And Sean McDonough, who's the Chief Technology Director for the Allegheny Immediate Unit, a regional provider, and Sean was formerly the Director of Educational Technology for the State of Pennsylvania, really made the point that it's important that you use the technology to empower the students. And giving students the ability to have that device, that's one way you can do that. We'll be sharing some of the information from the talks, including information that Sean shared as part of those resources that will be going out to you. So if you need to have that information, you need to use that for your school board, you'll have it, we'll be sharing that with you. There's also the challenge of cyber schools. As part of our roundtable, we had several superintendents talking. And here in Pennsylvania, it's been a major challenge for public schools with millions of dollars that have left the school, gone into the cyber charter schools. And what do the cyber charter schools do? They allow students to use their own devices. So another way to, for you to offset that challenge is to basically give the students that access so that you're giving them the same opportunity where they're making their choice, they're building their own school within your brick and mortar environment. One of the things that Mike talked about that often is brought up is in terms of reducing the cost of funding. But we know that you can save money, you may not need to do that recycling plan. Mike mentioned here in the state of Pennsylvania that we had basically a program where the state provided funds. And what's happened with many schools is that there was not money 
put into the schools for what happened when those computers are no longer accessible. That's what's happening to many school districts in Pennsylvania. Across the country, there have been similar kinds of initiatives like that. You need to be thinking about how can you come up with that balance so that you possibly can save funds in terms of the recycling, but you're still going to have to think about in terms of those students who still have to need and may not be able to buy the devices on their own. Which leads us to the whole issue of the other side of the coin. Why not bring your own device? Here are some of the things that often come up, and I'm going to ask Mike Graham to join me again, because Mike can actually address, were these really the issues and problems? Were there problems in terms of theft or damage? What about that inappropriate use? Were there any issues in terms of the data network? And what about compliance? So Mike, why don't you talk about what the reality was when people think about the why not side? Yeah, these are all uh, these are all very good questions, and um, interestingly enough, they were all questions that were asked by our teachers uh, when we held some uh, some faculty forums while we were in the planning stages. Uh, and uh, again, those, that form that we held with the staff was a great way to kind of gauge their um, uh, reaction, but also help us uh, come up with some questions going into this. And so, if anyone's thinking about it, I'd encourage you to really talk with your staff because uh, they've actually got a lot of good ideas uh, in terms of uh, safety and. Uh, and network usage and inappropriate use by staff. Um, one of the um, one of the things that we knew going in was that obviously we're going to have to be putting the devices on a content filtered network. Uh, but we really wanted to retain a lot of um, tracking ability, uh, but at the same time not overwhelm the students uh, to the point that it was a hurdle for them to get on the network. Uh, and so what we ended up doing was we adopted kind of a, a middle ground where. Uh, students had to log into the network as themselves, uh, but they didn't necessarily have to register the device ahead of time. Uh, but we were always able to track uh, what they were doing, um, but back to a username and password that every student had uh, that, that was individual to them. Uh, as far as uh, device theft and damage, uh, in all of the letters that we sent out, even before the pilot began, uh, we made it very clear that it was the student's responsibility uh, to keep that device safe uh, and that while the district would do everything within its power to investigate if uh, there was a theft, uh, it still fell to the student and the family if anything, um, if anything did occur. Uh, we did spend a good bit of time um, upgrading and, in, and improving our wireless network, uh, including redesigning uh, the way some of the, the subnets were set up. Uh, and increasing uh, the number of firewalls and other uh, security um, devices on our network to make sure that uh, we were um, everything on the network was safe. We we treated the student network very much as kind of the wild west in terms of uh, the student was really responsible for things like antivirus and everything like that, and that the uh, once they got onto that network, it was basically out to the internet or to a couple internal servers which were pretty heavily protected. Uh, like our um, uh, web server, Moodle, uh, some things like that. We purposely did not grant access to printers, uh, file servers, uh, everything along those lines. Uh, we, we went ahead uh, previously uh, for, for our own internal uses uh, and rolled out uh, Google Apps across the board, and that has been very, very successful. And moving to, you know, to Google Apps or, or name your, name your cloud-based service, um, all those internet-based services really are eliminating a lot of the needs for uh, students to come back into your network for a lot of things. And so having that in place ahead of time was really um, a plus for us. But if you are in a position where you have a lot of internal resources, you need to print, um, you know, it's a lot, uh, there's a lot more hurdles that you have to jump through and a lot more security considerations uh, that you need to put into place. I see mobile device management is another one up there. Again, we, uh, we tried not to make things too burdensome for the students to deter them from bringing in devices. Uh, so we really left it up to uh, the students to manage those devices. Uh, all we really cared about was that it was a student logging in, which again is why we required a, a username and password to get on the network. So Mike, you didn't really say you only could use certain devices. You left it up to the students to make those choices. We left it entirely up to the students. Uh, and we've seen everything from uh, MacBook Pros to Nintendo DSs to everything in between uh, show up on the network. Uh, for, and I'm kind of questioning whether the Nintendo DSs were actually used for research purposes, but uh, again, um, that's, that's really being policed by the teachers. And I, I think that's one of the other important points that I kind of missed earlier. 
was that one of the, the ways we got buy-in from our staff was that at, at the end of the day when everything is said and done, uh, the teacher still retains the, the right, um, the, the ability to say put the devices away, we're not using them right now. So even in the classroom, you know, when um, yeah, if if the devices are being used, the teacher can still say, right now we're you know working on something else. All the devices go away, uh, and that definitely helped with uh, some of the classroom management issues uh, and really allay some of those fears that came up as well. I think it's a good transition to the next slide. And Gary Steger was recently the keynote speaker for the Three Rivers Educational Technology Conference here in Pittsburgh, and Gary talks against a BYOD policy, and he looks at it from three different areas in terms of equity issues. And I think you began to really talk about these, and maybe we can think about these, and Mike, you can uh, explain, not all the students have devices, it's Gary's first point of view. And it sounds like in your case, because you gave choices, that students really could find all, a device that they could bring in, but if they couldn't bring in a device, well, I know in Fox Chapel what we often did is we had students work in collaborative groups. Was that how you would address that issue as well? Yes, it was. And, and uh, like you pointed out, we did not specify a particular device. We, um, we left it up to the students to bring in, uh, which obviously encouraged students to bring in the devices, but at the same time created an issue with teachers in that they didn't necessarily know uh, what devices were going to be coming in. Uh, so one of the, uh, the, one of the things that uh, our teachers kind of worked out was the ones that did want to use devices in their classrooms. We, uh, or I should say, they uh, took a poll at the beginning of every, um, you know, week, semester, whatever, and said, uh, you know, asked their class, what devices are you able to bring in on a, on a regular basis? And then they looked at uh, the, you know, what devices had web browsing capability, which ones, you know, had a laptop, things like that. Uh, and then kind of devised some activities around groups uh, so that there would always be a device that would be um, appropriate for the activity available to, you know, a group of students. Uh, it does not get us to a one-to-one -one initiative or a one-to-one -one arrangement, um, but it did supplement the technology that was available in the classroom uh, when a laptop cart was not available. So really, I think Gary Steger's point is well taken, but what you did was you planned had your teachers basically do the necessary preliminary surveying so they knew what the students were going to be able to bring in so that they weren't going to be asking students to be using an application that they wouldn't have access to. That's correct, yes. One of the things that I think it's important to think about is, is in terms of digital content. And one of the things that came up as a question from our audience had to do, for instance, in terms of SEPA, in terms of the Child Internet Protection Act, because we have to have ways that we are making sure that we're protecting those um, students by who are, I guess, at least from 13 to 18. So the question then becomes, did you have to do anything in particular as far as your content filtering when you looked at that digital content that you were trying to make available? Uh, we did make some adjustments. Um, we realized that because these were student devices and that really the, the staff would not be um, uh, really reviewing them with the, uh, actually at all, and I can talk about some of the legal issues we ran into there, um, but uh, we realized that we would want to have um, a little bit more protection on this network than we would have had on, a, on say, a normal uh, CART network or a staff network. Mm -hmm. uh, so in addition to all of the normal, you know, content filtering rules that we put into place, uh, we also put in an alert system uh, that works with our content filter where um, the student devices would be locked off out of the internet basically uh, if they hit a particular content category uh, too many times. So if you had a student who was kind of testing the filter to see what they could get to and what they could get around and you know they hit a particular category like porn or something else uh, one too many times, I forget what the threshold we said was, um, but if they hit that category too many times it actually locked them out um, of, the, uh, of the internet for a period of time, I think it's about 10 minutes, uh, and then the next time it escalates to I think 15 and then 30. Uh, and so by doing this, it kind of uh, forced the students to, in some ways, police themselves and that they realize that if you really keep trying to go to all that stuff you're not supposed to, your whole device gets kicked off and, um, you know, there's, uh, you, you can't get on the Internet and use it. There's no point in bringing it in. Uh, so in some ways, that was a really good for, for policing things. You know, we had a lot of hits on the, uh, the content filter the first couple weeks that we were offering the service, uh, and we did do a lot of investigating, but at the same time, uh, for a lot of the stuff, you know, trying to go to Facebook, things like that, uh, it, it really kind of fell off after the first uh, the first month or so when students realized that they were just getting kicked off 
Uh, and in many ways, unless it's a real serious thing that we're seeing popping up on the filter, uh, we don't do a whole lot in terms of following up because, uh, again, the, the devices are just getting kicked off uh, is punishment enough. I think that's really a very creative solution and one that I think some of our listeners will want to think about because I think by doing it that way and really going to more responsible use approach that the students then realize they're in charge and it's really up to them to make the right decisions. What about the teacher side? I mean, this is really probably one of the hardest things. You brought up the point that the teachers are really in charge. They make the decision. But how did you do the training? What did you do as far as getting the teachers so that they knew how to use those devices in the classroom and integrate those into their normal teaching instruction? Well, like I said before, the, the first thing we did really was start with uh, some just open forms where teachers could come and share their concerns, their ideas, uh, things like that. And so we used, um, uh, we used those responses to kind of guide the, um, the professional development sessions that we did do. And you know, we developed those practices like polling your students, uh, things along those lines. Initially, like I said, this was really um, a, the goal of this project was initially just to uh, teach more responsible use on the part of students. It wasn't, it was really more of an experiment, yeah, I, I would say, in terms of classroom instruction uh, when things first began. So we didn't have a, a large scale mm -hmm. plan to use this uh, with any um, dedicated professional development to everyone. However, uh, we have run and continue to run um, optional sessions. We run a, uh, a tech academy, uh, which is basically just a large collection of, um, of professional development sessions that teachers can pick from. Uh, we do continue to offer um, sessions that are focused on mobile devices um, because one of the things that it was kind of difficult was since we weren't uh, specifying the devices that could come in, uh, it's kind of tough to plan professional development when you, uh, you don't know exactly what you're going to be working with. So we wanted to see what uh, students would be bringing in and uh, it turns out that pretty much everything they bring, they're bring they bringing in, or at least the probably 95%, uh, are mobile phones, and specifically smartphones, or uh, we also have a large number of iPod touches uh, and those, those type of devices. Uh, so we've kind of since tailored the professional development to focus on um, uh, some applications that are really useful for those type of devices. Your, your polling applications, uh, Poll Anywhere was one that we worked on. Um, but uh, we kind of tailored it down from, you know, the um, larger applications, um, you know, iMovie, things like that, to something that was a little more appropriate for the BYOT environment based on what we were seeing uh, coming into the building. Since most of the devices are smartphones, is there an issue in terms of 3G or 4G connection? How do you handle that with your responsible use policy? Uh, the responsible use policy uh, basically says that you're not permitted to use the 3G uh, service on campus. Um, there's no way to enforce that. Um, so basically, uh, it really falls to um, the teacher to, uh, to really police. They can't really you know, look at what's on the student's phone. That was a privacy issue that uh, we had to address was that um, it is still a, a student-owned device, which means you can't grab it out of their hands and start rifling through the, um, the search history. Uh, so really the, the fallback is that if a teacher suspects something is wrong, uh, they still always have that fallback of just telling the student, you know, put the device away, you're not using it anymore. Uh, and that, that's pretty much eliminated any issues with uh, the 3G part. But, um, you know, we, we talked about it a lot. You know, I had some principals asking us if we could buy cell phone jammers and things like that, which I had to respond, no, we can't really do that. Um, but uh, if you get kind of get hung up on the 3G thing, you're not going to get anywhere because realistically there's no way to prevent it. And uh, if you let it be a hang up, you're never going to make uh, any headway, um, you know, with a proper BYOD uh, implementation. And we'll talk maybe a little bit more when we get to our, our final 10 points. But the buy-in by the students once they saw the reasons to use the devices seems to be one of the keys, that there was less reason to do things that would have been off task. Would you say that was really probably the case that developed for you? Yeah, yeah, I would say that's, uh, that's a good way to put it. Again, we were, we were really making it, we were really offering this as a service to students, uh, just you know, offering them a, a, a Wi-Fi connection that they could use in school uh, for, for research purposes, for their classwork, things like that. Uh, it's kind of more of an added, again, as an added service, uh, not necessarily um, a, a tool that's key to uh, any specific instruction. Uh, if it happens to help out, that's great. 
uh, but you know, just offering it as, a, as an added bonus to students, uh, I think, has increased uh, the number of devices coming in. What about that parent and board buy-in? I know that you really took some strong steps, and you want to talk about some of the ways that you were able to create that buy-in from your parents and your school board? Uh, we did. We uh, we sent out a number of letters uh, to to parents, and uh, I think there's some samples of those on that website if anyone's interested in looking at them. Um, but basically, uh, we just explained that uh, we were uh, taking a step forward and allowing students to to use their own devices. We recognize that uh, they use them for every other aspect of their life, and that there's no reason they shouldn't be allowed to to use them appropriately in school. Uh, and uh, you know, we would be setting up some guidelines and. Uh, this was in no way mandatory. We obviously got some questions about parents or from parents being concerned that they'd be required to buy their student device, and uh, we said no, that was not the case. Uh, we stressed that over and over that uh, this was purely optional and uh, was again just a service for uh, those students that wish to participate. Uh, and that that really uh, I, I want to say solved any of the parent issues we had. If we had gone another route and really you know looked at um, enforcing that or forcing people to bring in devices, it would have been another story because we definitely had some parents that, you know, or we had some, I should say, we had some students come to us and say, I've got a, an iPad, I've got a, uh, you know, an iPod Touch or something like that, uh, but my parents won't let me bring it in. Uh, and then we certainly have cases where the parents just don't want to let their students bring in the, the device that they got for Christmas or, uh, or something along those lines. So um, there are still some parent concerns there, but again, because it's optional, uh, we've, we've kind of gotten around those, uh, those concerns. As far as our school board goes, uh, we are very fortunate to have a, um, a forward-thinking board that's, uh, that's very good about trusting our administration. Uh, we spent a lot of time uh, talking with them about uh, the discipline issues uh, and really turning this from a conversation about technology to a conversation about uh, classroom management and how um, how teachers would, you know, deal with these devices as they were coming in in larger and larger numbers, uh, and kind of getting ahead of the curve and teaching that it's uh, that it's okay that to have the devices and how to use them responsibly. Um, that that was much better received than I think if we had just gone in and say, well, we're going to open the floodgates and let everybody onto the network and do whatever they want to. That sounds like you know, a successful plan. And we want to give our audience a chance to give a little more input. So we're going to have another poll. And Jeff, are you there to take over for a second now? It sounds like Jeff's not connected. Yeah, I'm on. Are you, do you oh, hear me now? Yes, there you are, Jeff. Do you want to talk about the poll then? Yep, we're just going to do a quick poll here on the plan designed to get parents mm -hmm. and board buy-in, or have you planned. You can answer yes, no, or I'm not sure. We'll uh, leave the poll open for about 10 seconds. Kylie, do we get to show the results on the other poll? I don't know if we want to show that after. I'm not sure if we got to show that, Norton. We're 77% polled voted right now. There we go. All right, go ahead, Kylie. I think at this point we got a, a decent amount. About 20% 20, 20 of you answered yes, 71% and 9%. I'm not sure. So those are good results. Kylie, is there any way to show the previous poll? There we go. Well, we missed this last time. We had a little bit of an uh, issue with my audio. But we had about 30% of you um, really not on the chart in any way with BYOD. 39% with limited access, 24 basic and roughly about 6% in some level would enhance or advance. So I just want to make sure we uh, we got to that one. So thanks, and go ahead, Norton. I really appreciate it, Jeff. And so what we want to do now is move in terms of what are the steps you need to start taking. And we really set the stage with the last thing that we just talked about, because the first place you have to begin is really to get the buy-in. You heard from Mike what he did in terms of his teachers, sitting down, talking, understanding what the issues were, trying to address the real issues versus those that were just perceptions, listening to your students, talking to your parents, getting the administrators on board, and really importantly, making sure that your board's on board. 
we want to make sure that the kind of information we're sharing with you, it's the information you can take to your board. It seems like a good number of you need this kind of information. So we're really hoping that this is helping you. So once you get basically that buy-in, where do you go next? Well, you may want to do some research. And we put here a list of some school districts, and we'll give you actually then URLs for each of these, depending upon what kind of size you are. Mike is at Hempfield School District. He's a medium-sized district. But Bailey Mitchell, who's at Forsyth County in Georgia, has been one of the national leaders. If you're in a larger district, if you need to really look at in terms of an excellent um, rollout, Forsyth County has probably had one of the best results in the country. Down in Texas, I had a chance to talk last year at the Texas Computer Educational Conference with Allen School District. They've taken a real strong initiative. They've been involved in a one-to-one -one for many years. They've had great success. You would definitely you can look at them. If you're looking at a smaller district, we have here in western Pennsylvania, Plum, that less than 5,000. So there are good examples of places you can go to find out. And what Mike has done is really phenomenal. You'll have a chance to go to his wiki site, which is just filled with all sorts of great resources. And maybe, Mike, talk a little about what are some of the resources that you shared with your wiki. Uh, sure. Uh, the wiki's kind of got an overview of what um, of what all I've talked about here today. We've got uh, a breakdown of the timeline that uh, that my staff and I and the high school administration went through uh, to to roll things out. Uh, we talk a little bit about the policies that we had to adjust. The you know the responsible use policy, the handbook, electronic devices. Uh, I talk a little bit about uh, network security and topology. What we had to do with our wireless network uh, to get that up to speed, moving from uh, you know, the standard, uh, you know, Best Buy wireless access points to uh, an enterprise system uh, with dual radios on each access point and things like that. Uh, and then finally, uh, what communication steps we took um, with, with, again, the, the different um, uh, stakeholders there, the principals, the parents, uh, students, things like that. Uh, and then finally, there's a, a wrap-up page there with uh, some usage stats. It's a little bit out of date. I think the last uh, update I put on there was on uh, from back in February of this year, uh, just talking about the types of devices we were seeing uh, and the number of logins. And that's out of a, uh, a 2000 um, student high school uh, that you're seeing daily logins from uh, around 200 to 300 devices per day. Oh, good. And I want to kind of go back to one of the other things you brought up, because I think the key questions are really, what are you trying to do with your, your project in terms of bringing your own device? And when you talked about, for instance, the teachers, it wasn't trying to change the entire curriculum. You looked at where this could make a difference, like in research. You brought up the idea, for instance, of polling and other ways that teachers could use these devices to get an inter and create an interactive environment for the student learning. And I think those are really critical. Also, how has this impacted the student's ability to access information outside school? Because I think that's really an important question to ask as well. Uh, yeah, I mean, as far as impacting outside of school, there's not uh, a whole lot that's changed because of this. I mean, all of the resources that the, um, the students are accessing inside of the district are, are available outside. Uh, I mentioned, you know, moving to some cloud-based resources uh, like Google Apps and things like that. Uh, have really transformed the way that we do work, uh, or that the students do work in the classroom. Uh, we've pretty much moved away from the, you know, the old uh, file server that sits there for with everybody's files on it. Uh, we, we've pretty much phased those out, except in a couple um, very specific um, areas. So uh, as we've moved all those online, those resources into cloud services, into Moodle, uh, the, the resources that the students are accessing at home uh, are the same resources they're able to access on the mobile device, uh, whether it's in school or out of school. Good. And I think one of the things that often doesn't get enough attention is the importance of really addressing that idea of digital citizenship and having that put into your curriculum. How did you handle that for Hemfield? Was there a focus at different levels looking at in terms of that sense of responsibility and what's involved becoming a digital citizen, having access to a device like this? Uh, prior to prior to the, the BYOD initiative, there wasn't a whole lot of focus on uh, on personal devices and using them. Now we've we've revamped. Uh, we did always have a, a, a 21st century skills um, outline of where different things are different, taught in different uh, areas, uh, but there wasn't a whole lot of focus on um, you know responsible use 
And uh, one of the things that we ended up doing was prior to this, uh, to this rollout, about a year before the, the BYOD thing started, uh, we did change our, we had previously had an acceptable use policy. Uh, we purposely changed that to a responsible use policy uh, to move in a direction where we were encouraging responsible use as opposed to just a list of rules. Uh, and uh, since then, since BOIID, we've, we've kind of updated a lot of the um, sessions uh, or the, uh, the classes and push-ins that we've done uh, for instruction to, to focus on uh, how to use these devices appropriately. Uh, you know, we do, the, for all of the incoming freshmen at our high school, we always do a, um, an opening session where they're introduced to the high school, but we dedicate some time to talking about the fact that there's now a wireless network that you can be on. It's a privilege of being here at the high school, uh, but you need to use it responsibly. Um, along with the, the update in the curriculum due to the uh, updated E-rate uh, regulations, uh, we've, we've pushed uh, some of those responsible use uh, lessons further down uh, as we rolled out the guest network or the student network to uh, the middle school. Uh, we've also had some talks um, in classes there as well. And you mentioned earlier that you really explained to the parents that these are personal devices, therefore it's not the district's responsibility for repair, for maintenance. Those are elements that you really have to spell out up front. That's correct, yes. Uh, and if you want to go the route of having the district uh, be responsible for all those devices, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. It just opens up a lot of doors and you have to be prepared to have the staff on hand um, to deal with all of the uh, crazy changes that uh, are crazy different devices that can come in. Uh, we allow um, uh, student teachers to bring in their own devices as well. And now we give them a little bit more access than we give to, uh, to the students. Uh, but just supporting the student teachers, and you know, there's only maybe 20 or 30 of them uh, that we have at our high school in a given year, uh, just supporting all the different devices that they bring in uh, is a time-consuming task, let alone uh, you know, all of the different student devices that we could potentially see. I also want to highlight one of the key points I think you made is that you started with a pilot project, you started small, you found out and got information and then used that information to build from. I really think that's one of the keys for success. And another thing which I think is really important is finding partners in terms of whether it be a company that's working with you, whether it be in terms of higher education, provider, other schools, were you able to find those kinds of partners that helped you as you move forward? Uh, actually, no. Uh, at the time uh, that we started this back in 2000, uh, 2009, we started talking about it. Nobody, uh, nobody was really doing it back then. Uh, we were fortunate, though, in uh, we did have some partners, um, not necessarily in strictly BYOD, but we did have some good consultants uh, talk to us about wireless networks and um, work out a lot of the hardware requirements, which uh, which was important. You know, we can our principals are very very good at dealing with classroom management issues. Uh, we didn't necessarily need a, a whole lot of help there, but uh, when it came to the hardware, um, there were some people there, some other companies that helped us uh, get up and running, or I should say, scale out our existing uh, wireless network. But I think you know your point's well taken. When you started, you were really a pioneer. Today, there are these other schools, there are other organizations. I had mentioned, for instance, the connection I had made with Carnegie Mellon. You have higher education who often is willing to open and, and give some support and help. And you have regional providers, whether it be an intermediate unit here in Pennsylvania, BOCI in New York, or similar types of organizations throughout the country. Today, they all have a lot of experience. They have resources that can be shared. But I think what you highlight is probably one of the most important things is that even though this is about teaching and learning, you have to make sure that you really have that wireless infrastructure. And having a company that come, come in and pro give you some of the, the behind the scenes look at that wireless network is something you probably want to consider. The other thing which I think is really important that people don't often do is to think about what are you trying to do? How are you going to measure your success? Are you going to be looking at the impact in terms of learning? Are you going to be looking at it, as Mike was talking about, with 21st century skills? Are you going to be looking at it in terms of technology issues that you're trying to address? So before you go down the path, make sure that you have a thought in terms of what are you trying to be doing and how are you going to know that you've been successful? You want to think about some of those necessary resources, and we've talked about those. And I look at this in terms of basically as a series of gears that have to mesh together. So you always have to start and think about your curriculum instruction. Start with what are you trying to have the kids learn? What's going to be going on? And then you want to think about how's that going to fit in in terms of 
the infrastructure you have in place, and how are you going to make that training and professional development happen? You heard Mike's example, which I think was really great in terms of bringing the teachers on board, giving them the opportunities to make some of the choices, but thinking about this as a whole, not as separate elements. You want to look at your existing IT systems. What do you have in place? Are you going to need to think about storage, or are you going to do as Mike had brought up? Are you going to think about a cloud-based solution? The cloud is providing all sorts of new opportunities, but you have to be thinking about what will that mean? What about in terms of your help desk? If there's a problem, who's going to address those issues? Who's going to be the person that's going to help the kids? Or are you going to have the kids take on some of the responsibility for themselves, for the management? Those are things you need to be thinking of ahead of time and making sure that you have really thought through and make sure things are in place. And then, most importantly, you want to think about in terms of teaching and learning. You don't want to get caught in the graveyard of the latest technology fad. You don't want to have basically a netbook that would look like it might be a great tool, but it didn't work. I remember I had one of the first Apple Newtons. How long did that last? You don't want to be just out there. Today, you have a chance to learn from other people, a chance to really make this work for you. And Mike, we'll let you kind of wrap up now in terms of your kind of final thoughts, because I think you've done an excellent job setting the stage, giving a lot of good information, and just sharing with us what this has really meant for your students. Yeah, I, I think you, well, you've got my quote up there on the screen, and I think that really kind of sums up uh, where we're at uh, with BYO, BYOD in that it's, uh, you know, we went into it not necessarily having a specific goal of replacing anything, but it, it answered a lot of questions for us and helped solidify uh, where we want to go in that we certainly do want to um, encourage or and teach those, uh, that responsible use with 21st century skills with personal devices. Uh, and so, you know, we're looking ahead at, at a one-to-one -one program, uh, something with tablets probably, uh, down the road a little bit. Uh, so we've kind of recognized that we want to get a, de a device into every student's hands. Um, but, uh, you know, BYOD, while it hasn't solved all the problems, it's, it's taught us a lot of things about classroom management, about uh, what students are going to do when they have that device on their own time, uh, when, they're, when they're in the library, things like that. So in terms of, of students right now, it's, it's definitely helped them, um, you know, be more productive doing research, uh, be more productive in the classes where they're, uh, where they're using those devices to interact. Um, but I think probably the bigger gain is for us as a district, um, you know, getting, gaining some more of that knowledge uh, and being able to make some good decisions uh, about where we go for a next step. Well, Mike, I really thank you. I think you've given us some great insight wonderful information. QuestTech will be sharing, as I mentioned, in terms of that wiki site. We'll be sharing some of the other resources and some of the links that we've talked about. And we really enjoy the opportunity to share this with a national audience. And I think I'll let's turn this over to Jeff. And Jeff, do you want to just kind of wrap up? And if there are any final questions that we have from our audience. But this has been, I think, a great opportunity to deal with a really important topic. So everyone out there, thanks for joining us. Yeah, Norton, I think at this point um, we can take some questions. I think we did this last time. Mike, you're still there, right? Yep, still here. Uh, we, I think we took them through the chat window, uh, if that's correct, Carly. So if anybody has any questions for Mike, um, you could throw those in the chat window right now. Everybody's probably looking for the chat window. It's down the bottom of your screen. <laughs> we got 45 attendees on there. Do we, Kylie? Do you do uh, want to uh, enable the uh, ability to let anybody speak? No, I don't have any chat questions, Mike. Well, One thing, Mike, I, I did have a question for you. I think it's really important for the audience to hear one thing you've said, and especially of all the schools that we've been to in the last few weeks, that, you know, when do you, do you jump from now to be to one-to-one, -to -one, or do you advise people to kind of go through BYOD first and then consider one-to-one? -one? I think it's a huge question we're seeing everybody. Yeah, well, I think, you know, even when we get to one-to-one, -to -one, um, we, are, we are still going to offer the option uh, for students to bring in their own devices. Now, we'll probably put some um, some specifications on what they can actually bring in, but 
Uh, I don't think, uh, you know, BYOD is not going to go away. We're not going to suddenly turn that network off uh, once, once we get to a one-to-one -one implementation. Uh, and I think the, the lessons that you can learn from doing one-to-one -one and doing it well uh, are really going to benefit you when you deal with, um, you know, with, with hundreds or thousands of devices, uh, you know, with individual students. Uh, and, and I guess one of the things I didn't really mention there was that um, allowing students to bring in devices, allowing, you know, the potential for every student to have a device, uh, this was kind of a, an ease into, into that idea for our faculty and staff in that uh, I think it is a very good bridge, um, depending on how your, district, um, how your district works and what the culture's like, it is a very good bridge from, you know, a static um, laptop cart environment to a full-blown one-to-one. This, this can be a nice bridge in between the two. Uh, I saw a question there about do we utilize laptop cart or labs? Yeah, I just found the questions. Yep. I, uh, uh, the questions are in the question list. <laughs> so do you see um, those questions, Mike? <laughs> yes, I do. Uh, we, we utilize uh, labs and laptop carts. Um, we have three labs in our high school of 2,200 kids, uh, three general, general use labs. Uh, and about 15 laptop carts. Um, again, that's that's only about uh, 500 machines total out of 2,200 kids. Uh, so we're not anywhere near a one-to-one -one deployment, uh, but that is the direction we're trying to go. However, uh, that one-to-one -one will probably be in the form of a, a tablet or a mobile device instead of a, a full-blown laptop. Um, the biggest disaster in our ex in my experience. Um, I don't want to say we've really had any disasters, um, you know, contrary to the, uh, the title of the, um, the presentation here today. I, I think one of the, um, one of the, the, the problems, or not necessarily problems, but um, kind of sad parts is in, in doing this, we certainly, we very quickly learned, um, you know, who our staff members were that uh, were absolutely dead set against all this. and. While some of them have come through and, and really changed their, um, their thinking about things, we've also had some that have kind of solidified in their opinions, and, and that's never going to change. Uh, but, you know, that's, that, that's life. There's a question that came up about virtualized solutions. Maybe, Jeff, you can jump on board that, because we've had a recent situation where we're trying to look at what does virtualized desktops really provide. And yeah. if you're thinking about anytime, anywhere access, a virtual solution really does not seem to meet that. And do you want to just explain a little bit more, Jeff, in terms of what we found out in terms of some virtualized And, and I can chime in on that as well, Norton. We're starting to look okay. at that as well. Yeah, I, I think well, recently we've looked at a, we did a, we've done assessments for a few districts around the state of Pennsylvania, and they did have a VDI solution. Um, one in particular uses virtual bridges. And after we did the assessment, though, we found that about 80% of the apps that they were consuming in the classroom on the laptops were web-based anyway. And the in the 20% were, were could have been moved to the web, and 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 they and they really did not need the virtualization to stream those apps. So, I guess in districts that have a lot more legacy apps that are localized, and virtualization is streaming with something like Zen Server, Zen App is uh, works very well. And I think in the future, depending on which tablet people go with, uh, and how the Surface Pro ends up playing into it, uh, if you want to deliver legacy Windows apps over a virtualized a streaming system, then I think that's going to play pretty big in K-12. Go ahead, Mike. There's a question about bandwidth, and I just want to bring up the point that I know talking with Bailey Mitchell in Forsyth County in Georgia, it's critical that you really do think about upgrading your bandwidth. And Mike, can you maybe address that as well, what you have to yeah, do? Yeah, uh, we, do, uh, we do put a bandwidth cap. It's a per user bandwidth cap uh, on our student network. I think it's like 756K. Um, so it, it still works perfectly fine for web browsing, but it, it really deters a lot of the heavy, heavy bandwidth use. Uh, we do not, um, we do block YouTube access on that uh, that site, so that cuts down on a lot of streaming video. Uh, but it doesn't, um, it doesn't uh, really restrict them from doing anything uh, specific. Um, and as far as application virtualization, uh, that again really wasn't an option for us back in 2009. Uh, we are starting to to look at application virtualization and probably rolling that out in another year. Uh, I'm not entirely sure yet if we're going to offer it for uh, the BYOD devices, um, but uh, it's certainly something we're looking at to increase the uh, the value of bringing the device in. 
and I think we're getting to the point where we're going to have to maybe say, Jeff, that we'll try to answer some of these questions afterwards and send information out to the, to the group since we really have used up our hour. But it's really good to see that there's a lot of interest. Um, I think we've addressed a lot of issues, and we'll try to continue to keep in touch with the folks and make sure we get information out to them to try to address any of the questions that came up that we weren't able to answer. That sounds good. So thank you, Mike, again. And thank you, everybody. Everybody uh, look for a uh, potential invite or talk to people at Quest Tech if you get a chance about our BYOD Wireless Heinz Field event in January 24th. And look forward to uh, more thought-provoking webinars like this coming forward. And I thank everybody for being involved with us today and look forward to seeing you at the next, next webinar. Thank you.